So good morning, everyone. We are back in Colossians chapter 3. We're going to do uh, through verse 11. I was going to go a little bit further than that, but we're going to overlap because um, we covered the first uh, couple of um, verses last week, but we're going to cover them again. So uh, let me pray before we get started. Father God, uh, as always, I'm thankful for your word. I'm thankful for this fellowship of believers. Lord, as uh, as we get into your word, I pray that you would help me. Lord, that you would uh, just send your spirit so I could uh, teach what you would have, that you would prepare every heart to receive what you would have. Lord, we have your word, your uh, love letter to us, and pray that we would learn from it and uh, grow from it and be blessed by it. In Jesus' name, amen. So the reminder why we do this, growing as believers, and this is uh, pertinent to this passage just like it is every passage, but uh, in our world, I feel like this passage is, that we're in today is particularly powerful. So we want to th- be I always thinking about what is God saying to, in, uh, saying to you in his word, and what am I going to do about that? Meaning, how do we apply this to our lives? That's what we should be thinking about when we do our uh, devotions, uh, each of us individually, and as we get to together so hopefully hopefully we see our lives changed but what I wanted to do is before we before we get into the meat of the word today I just wanted to share with you uh, just an overview of where we're at so this is a real uh, bare bones outline of the book of Colossians so we know where we're at so uh, Paul does start with a greeting but then he begins to talk about the person and work of Jesus Christ and the importance of establishing this is that that never changes. The person and work of Jesus never changes. Uh, and it's important that he lays that down because biblical Christianity is the only religion I know of that God did the work to get to us. We failed as sinners need redemption and he sent his son jesus christ to do that redemption all we have to do as sinners is receive romans 10 9 if you confess with your mouth that jesus is lord and believe in your heart that god raised him from the dead you will be saved that's what it tells us grace through faith and uh no works no nothing can save us just god's god's work and we want to live a certain life because of that and the reason why paul puts that down first is because there's a number of heresies out there that we covered in chapter two, the heresy of Gnosticism that's out there. Those messages are on the internet. And there's a lot of people, things that people are trying to inject into God's word to say that, well, there's grace through faith, but wait, you have to do something. You have to attach a work. You have to attach something to that to earn your salvation. And they get it backwards. So Paul is being clear to establish who Jesus is and then talk about the heresies. And now what he's going to get into is the way to live like Jesus. So if you see the, the, what Paul is getting through, the way to live like Jesus, that's where we're at today. So how he goes about that in this chapter today when we cover, cover through 11, he, uh, verse 11 of this chapter, he's going to cover the things that you don't do, and then next week we'll get into what it looks like to be a Christian. So Paul is covering both sides of the coin because he feels like, I don't want to just give you what to do, what also what not to do. And he breaks it down into lists so we can look at our lives and see what it is. But Uh, The overlap from last week is this section right here, one through four. And so Paul says this, so if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God and set your minds on the things above, not earthly things. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. So not only, not only is he shooting holes in um, what the false religions are saying and try to attach with Christianity, he's telling us who we are in Christ and how we should be living. Because uh, the thing is, if we have been raised with Christ, seek the things above. So that's, there's a lot there, right? Because right now on earth, I have not seen the resurrection of the Lord, right? I've not died and gone to be in heaven with him. But Hebrews 11 talks to us about the hope of that resurrection. And so uh, hope 
is one of the things that we should be leaning on. And I'm going to show you what that says, what uh, Hebrews 11.1, 1, if I can get there, it says, now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. Hmm. For by it our approver, uh, approval, ancestors won God's approval. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that it was seen, it was made, and the things are visible. And by faith Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain. And then he goes on to say, By faith Enoch was taken away. By faith Noah. By faith Abraham. And so by faith Sarah herself. So we, we, we think about Abraham and that he received grace through faith, right? Uh, in uh, Genesis, twel- uh, Genesis 12, it said he believed and it was counted to him as righteousness, right? And Abraham was given this promise. He saw his son come, but he didn't leave to see the whole fulfillment of the promise, but he knew that the promise was true and he lived like it was true because he believed. And in the same way, when we look back at the people who have come before us, we know that God made good on that promise because Jesus came, the promise that he made to all people and then the specific promises he made to Abraham. So we need to understand that when Paul is saying this, that, that we seek the, uh, that we've been raised with Christ, we know because the promise is true that that's a sealed deal. Even though all of us who are living right now have not died and raised with Christ, it's true as true can be. Because God's promise is true. He's proven that it's true. So we are raised with Christ to new life, right? And so when we believe, and in our baptism, which he's alluding to here, I think, when, when it gets a little bit further, since we've been raised with Christ to new life, We should act like we are believers who have been raised to new life. So understanding fully that, hey, we have the promise now. God walks with us now, and he's changing us to new life now, and we'll be resurrected with Jesus in the resurrection upon our death or upon the rapture, right? So what he's saying is that if you know that you're going to be in heaven with God, seated at the right hand of the Father, we should act like it, and we should set our minds on the things above, not earthly things. Right, and so um, this doesn't mean that that we should necessarily be um, ostriches and bury our heads in the sand and not have any real understanding of the reality around us. But it should affect us differently than the rest of the world. If we know because of this, this thing that we should is true, we shouldn't set our mind on earthly things. We should be thinking about. How much time do I spend worrying about things that are on earth and that are happening on earth if I know that God's in heaven seated at the right hand of God and I know I'm going to be there one day, right? It should affect how we live. And that's going to look different for each one of us, but but the reality is there's the heart of that matter where... How do we live our lives? How does that look in your heart? How does how do you know that you were looking on the things above? And it's one of those things that could look different in all of us. You know, sometimes sometimes people are all wound up about stuff and I'm just like, it is what it is. I'm just not too wound up right about that now. When I'm when I'm in the right space I'm supposed to be with God, right? And when I'm not, I can tell because I'm wound up and I'm all like, ah, oh, worried about all these things and I don't have the peace that passes understanding and, and the world seems big and heavy. And then when I get my eyes back on God, it's like, well, I'm good because I have my eyes on God. And you guys, whatever the example is in your life as you look at it this week, hopefully you'll be able to see and tell the difference. Am I looking on earthly things or am I looking at above? So part of this scripture, as, we, as hopefully you'll go through it this week, diagnose, ask God, am I worried about the wrong things? Do I have my eyes on the things above or I'm looking at the things around me and worrying about the wrong things? It's a question we should ask ourselves. That's what Paul is saying. Because if you, if you died, your life is hidden with Christ and God, which is when Christ your life appears, you will also appear with him in glory. Again, he goes back to that. What are we looking at? When you, in your baptism, when you made that confession of faith, Romans 10, 9, confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead, when you went into the waters of baptism, Romans 6, when you're buried with Christ, that's the picture of him being buried in the ground and free from sin. And when you're brought up, you're brought up to new life again. 
And that's the picture that I think he's talking about here. You are hidden with Christ because you, you share in his death, the death of sin that he conquered for you on the cross, that he conquered for all of us. So when, we, when, when we're hidden with Christ in God, we're going to appear with him, right? So you see how he goes that God is this, look at heaven, remember who Jesus is. So it's important that as we look at our life in Christ, that we have new life in Christ. And sometimes when you wake up and life is busy or it's crazy or you don't feel well, all of us, it's easy to get focused on what's going on here in the here and now. But life is so much better when we're focused on Christ. And I use this example often. Um, Paul, in, in, uh, when he was in Philippi, he'd just taken a beating. He got thrown into the inner prison. So he's, he's, he's jailed, he's beaten, and he is singing a hymn. Because he has, what the, what the early believers said is, they, counted, they, they glorified that they were counted worthy to suffer for Christ. And because he had that eternal perspective, and I can tell you right now, if I'd taken a beating and end up in jail, I would not be singing a hymn right? <laughs> That's just not the default mindset when you've had that happen, right? But because of what he did, God acted. He shook the prison there in Philippi. And this is from Acts chapter 16. And the doors came open and the jailer thought he was going to die. But because Paul was where Christ wanted him and acting how he wanted him, Paul was able to say, don't fall on your sword. Don't kill yourself. We're still here. And then this man comes to faith. He and his whole family in the Philippian church is born. Paul suffered a lot of things and he didn't get bound up on even the pain and the trial. And because of that, his ministry went forward. We see the example. So when Paul says this, he's not a guy who's just saying to us, hey, you should do this because it sounds cool. He's a man who lived it. And hopefully, you know, we're not the Apostle Paul, right? That should give us hope. And that's one of the things in our faith. We're, gonna ha we're each going to have a different experience. It's going to look different for each one of us. I kind of hope I don't end up in prison having taken a beating. But if it does, I hope I'm Paul-like. But you have to look at those situations and say, what is my situation? What does God want me to do in my situation? Right? So that's, so that's what he's saying. You're, you're, you're supposed to be living like Christ. And if you're supposed to be living like Christ, Paul then goes to this. Therefore. Right? And just like all the therefores, when therefore, it, you come to therefore in the Bible, you have to ask what it's there for. Referring back to what we just all talked about, because you're living with Christ, because you're a believer, therefore, or because of that, here's what you need to do now. And he goes on in this whole section. So he says, therefore, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. And you once walked in these things and when you were living in them. But now put away all the following anger, wrath, malice, slander, filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you've put off the old self with its practices and do uh, and you have put on the new self. You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your creator. In Christ, there's no Greek, Jew, no circumcision, no uncircumcision, no barbarian, no Scythian, no slave and free, but Christ is all in all. So in those few verses, those six verses, he just cram packs a ton of stuff in there today. And so just wanted to look at these. So the whole thing, therefore, because you're living with Christ, because you've been buried with Christ in the waters of baptism, because of your confession, we should start living a different life. And he gives this list, but it's all under this earthly nature. And it's not hard to look around the world and see what the earthly nature is. Watch 20 minutes of the news and you will see it on full display. Watch any TV show out there. Watch most any movie. You will see it on full display. And so he's telling us as believers, he's going to give, and this, I don't know that this is a, a, a fully exhaustive list, but I think these are some of the major ones, right? But the earth, earthly nature, right? Sexual immorality, impurity and lust. Seems like those are together, right? 
But uh, just to cover a few of those, and I'm not going to try to bore you with, with all the things, but I wanted to give you some of what the definitions of those words are. So the root word of that sexual immorality, they had to put it there too, but the, the Greek word would be pornea. This is where we get the word pornography. And so whether, whether it's telling us whether you are scrolling on your computer and right-clicking or whether you, got a, whether you got a track playing in your mind, that's what it would be. Pornea, the, the viewing of those sorts of things and objectifying that. And that leads to part of that word is also in the, in the Greek is fornication. And fornication is any sexual act outside of marriage. And so this is the whole gambit. This is where we see a lot in our society. This would include like we see a lot of young men where, where the fornication doesn't have to be with another human. This could be watching porn and masturbation. This is a thing that is common in our society. And Paul starts with that right away because from the dawn of time, that was one of the things that came with the fall of man. Adam and Eve were naked until they sinned, and as soon as they sinned, they covered themselves, right? That's one of the things. So Paul puts it first there. I mean, he was in a time that was just as probably as debased as this one. There was all these Greek temples, and they had uh, sexual uh, uh, things uh, on the temples, young boys. It was really bad. And so uh, it, it was, we, we, and it's bad now, I'm not playing it down, but this has always been a problem. <coughs> and what he's saying, especially to the believers of that time and to the believers of this, now that you have Christ, it's time to get this out of your life. And this applies to, you know, people have asked me, well, why is the church so against the homosexual movement? Well, because this relationship was designed for one man, for one woman, for a lifetime. And we as believers, if you become a believer, if you are promiscuous or you have a porn issue, you have to put that out of your life and become holy like Christ, just like anybody who's out there who's a homosexual who, who, who wrestles with that. These are the things that God wants us to put on out of our life. So he doesn't he doesn't make distinction between heterosexual or homosexual any of that sexual stuff we're supposed to put it out of our life so when we when we as believers look at this we need to look at it it's okay to look at the world and understand that but part of this paul is telling us as believers what about you what about me are we a people who have put this out of our life and so tied with that is lust and evil desire. Now, this is interesting. The Greek words, all these Greek words have, they, they, they have ver different verb tenses. And uh, uh, I'm not a great student of English, but all these verbs, uh, it says that they, they are, uh, the form of verb it is, is it's an accusative, singular, feminine term in the greek so when it's so so these are actually accusatory terms put this out of your life singular to the individual and feminine i don't know exactly what that means but that's that's a lot of the language just is gendered like that but just understand each one of these things is accusative and singular to me to you and so 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 then he goes on to say lust so this is passion or emotion and it's just strong things like that, right? Lust, keep lust from your eyes. Uh, evil desire, so it's bad, wrong, harm, worthless. Longing for what is forbidden, right? That's a big thing in our society today. Oh, look, here's the line of what God said. Everything on the other side of the line, it's sin and it's forbidden, right? People want to run to what is forbidden because there's... When you first get into sin, right, it's exciting and you're out there and the sin seems okay and, 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 and it's thrilling and, it, and sin always is for a minute, right? When you eat the forbidden fruit, it's exhilarating for a minute until you start to suffer the consequences and you're trapped in the sin and then you know what it is? It's just bad. It's evil desire. It, it, it tears you apart. If, if each one of us can remember that in our lives, that, that the things maybe when we were younger or you see a younger person step over into that thing where you get the forbidden, into the forbidden thing, the evil desire, when you cross that line, you can't uncross it. It's a bad thing. So we need to, even in our minds as believers as we think, we should not even be dwelling on 
oh, remember what I used to do? Or remember how, how mysterious and fancy sin, sin seems, you know, right? Because that, that's, how the, that's how the devil makes his lies, right? The forbidden fruit seems mysterious and good and fancy, right? Keep your eyes on things above, right? That's what he's saying. So uh, evil desire, greed, which is idolatry. Because when we look around, and, and, and the, term, the term, so he goes from this physical thing, because I think lust, you can look for evil passion and desire and things that are money too. So he connects greed with that. Greed, which is idolatry, right? And, and, the, and what is the term we use in, this, uh, in America now, keeping up with the Joneses? You see, uh, I had a friend who worked at a refinery. Um, it's actually a friend of mine's dad. And he said, uh, he said that, you know, way back when, when a guy would make a lot of money, a guy would show up with a new pickup. Next thing you know, within the, new, within, the, within the month, you'd have 20 guys with brand new pickups, right? Greed. Somebody has something newer, better, fancier than mine. I need to, I need to go get what they have. I want what somebody has. And in greed, it destroys godly contentment, right? We can keep up the Joneses, keep up with the Joneses, and, and uh, get ourselves into all kinds of trouble. And there's an important thing in here that it's not bad to have stuff. It's not bad to have uh, whatever it is you have. Uh, you know, people have boats. People have motorcycles. People, people do things for leisure. That's fine as a believer, right? But it's one of those things where, where where's your heart lie, right? And so as we look at those things, we don't want to feel guilty about the gifts that God's given us if we've managed it well, and God is the center of our life. Where, where it, it, it turns into that is if, you're, it, it, is if you're in a place where you're worshiping that thing and you're greedy over it to be like your neighbor rather than to have something to enjoy because God has provided. There's a whole different realm of thinking in there. So because of these... Because of these, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. And understand this, that some people really love the whole concept of God's wrath. Because those who are disobedient, and I think this refers to unbelievers, because later he's going to talk about how you once were. But understand this, when we look at the world, there is, there is a number of Christians who look at the world and they're just all about wrath. Yeah, God is going to come and he's going to get these dirty sinners and he's going to pour out his wrath. You see it, you see it in uh, Revelation 12 when he starts to open the seven seals. I think it's 12. And things get bad, right? God is going to pour out his wrath because he is just to do that. Romans 3 tells us God is just but he's also the justifier. So we need to understand, he says this for a couple reasons. God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. First of all, the people that are out there being disobedient, we should be people who want to share the gospel with those people because God doesn't want to see anybody d destroyed in his wrath. So we shouldn't either. But God is just to bring the wrath for those who reject him, right? So it's our job not to be wrathful against those people, but to share the gospel. Understand what they're doing is wrong. We should be new, new creations in Christ and not live like that. But our mindset should not be, yeah, God's going to pour out his wrath and he's going to kill all these people. That should not be our mindset, right? Because we want to share the gospel for him. But we should also look at, a, look, at, look at this. Hey, look, obedience is not a word that people like in this society. But guess what? God wants us to be obedient to his word. He went to the cross to die for us. It's okay for him to ask us to be obedient in taking these things out of our life. I died for you not to have sin. Take the lust out of your life. That's not unreasonable. God is within his justice to ask us to do that. So as we look at this and apply it to our lives... We have to ask yourself, we have to ask ourselves, do I really want to be obedient to God? Because when I look at that forbidden fruit, it's temptation and you have a thing there. Do I look at the things above or do I, do I want to be disobedient? Oh, it's okay if I, as a believer, have some disobedience. It's okay. I'll just get back to forgiveness, right? I can be obedient now and I'll just take care of that with God later. We've all made this justification. We're Americans, man. We're good at this. Or I should say... I'm good at this as an American, justifying whatever, whatever I want, right? We as believers, when we see this, shocked that other people are going to die in wrath, and we should be seeking to be obedient to Christ and what he wants. So he puts that there in the middle, and then he goes on, because you once walked in these things when you were living like them. 
Now, this is where the tense has changed. This is what it looked like. They were singular and accusative. And what it should be saying to the believer is, look, you were like that. And then you met me and I changed you. You should be changed. Don't be disobedient. You were changed because now you are free to live how God wants you to. Have you ever thought about how awesome it is to be free? When people are in sin, they're not free. They're in bondage. And even if you have to work to get out of sin when you're a believer, guess what? You're free to be free. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. That's what the Bible says, right? But when people are caught in sin, they're only caught in sin. It's drudgery. It's pain. It's disaster. We've probably all been there in some way or we've seen people in our lives that are there, right? You once, each one of us, our identity, we were once like that, now we're free because we were buried with Christ and we should be looking at the things above. And then he reminds us again, he goes to a different list now, and it's always good to look at the list, but put away all the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander, filthy language from your mouth. So, Wrath, right? So he talks about anger, and, and anger and wrath are just a little bit different. So anger is, is excitement of mind, violent passion, implied punishment or vengeance. Now this word for wrath that he used, the first word for wrath when he talks about uh, God's wrath is he orge, and I'm not sure if he's saying that right, but this one translated is thiamos. And those two are together because, again, you want to think about this, anger. Look at the, you know, have you heard the term anger mongers? People get a high and a sense of euphoria because they have a sense of outrage, because they're anger. Again, we see this in our society. You see the picture of somebody who's upset about something on the news and they're just screaming, right? And wailing and all this, all this craziness, right? Because they get a little, you get a little of excitement in mind. You have violent passion. And God says, that's not how you're supposed to be, right? That's how you used to live. It's not how you're supposed to live now. And then when he gets to wrath, <clears throat> so this is not God's wrath. It says, of passion as if creating hard fierceness or indignation, so just, just thinking about creating hard fierceness or indignation. So God's wrath is a thing that he's going to carry out because of those are disobedience. This word talks about indignation or your passions that are connected to anger. And we have to remember that when we look at the world, we're supposed to share the gospel and realize that God is big enough to take care of that. The Lord says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. We're not supposed to be out for vengeance or fierceness or indignation. Sure, it's hard not to be indignant when you see a sinful world. We're not supposed to deny that sin is sin and sin is bad, right? There's a, there's a proper place and context for that. But what he's saying is when you get sinful in there and you try to have the same kind of wrath that God is able to have because he's just, those are different things. And we need to stay away from that emotional rage that comes with us. And then malice, maliciousness, depravity, trouble, evil, naughtiness, and wickedness. And so just, you know, we, we, we have seen people be malicious, right? You can think about that. So, so again, when we think about these things, we need to look at our lives and go, Lord, am I doing these things? What do I need to take care of, care of, care of in my life? And then slander. Slander is vilification, blasphemy, evil speaking, and railing against somebody, and again, we, th we live in a world where this gets on us, right? Even if you're not that kind of nature person, we just, this, all this stuff is just circling around us. So it's important for us to keep our eyes on things above. And then the last thing, filthy language from your mouth. And we live in a society where this is hard. I, it just, just silly talk and, and, and kidding around and stuff. I'm, this is one I probably struggled with the most because you know, I just grew up where you break a buddy's chops, you know, even your friends, you just give them a hard time. So it's, it's one of those things where uh, on the job site or whatever old habits, that's, that's God says, Hey, don't, don't do that. Right. And so, so in that, even if you're, that's one of the things I struggle with, because sometimes you're kidding around with a buddy. I don't know about you guys. And it's, it's kind of filthy, but then you're like, Oh, maybe that was over the line. But we both thought it was funny. What does God think, right? That's the question. What, is, what does God think about these things? So now that we have the list, he's going to continue on, and he, he, he ends with this. Don't lie to one another. Why? 
Satan is the father of lies. And we live in a world where the white lie is okay. And this is another one. Am I telling the truth? Am I making sure that the things that I'm saying are not a lie? Because it's easy to read something that's a lie and then perpetuate a lie, not even knowing that you're perpetuating a lie. And here's, because they call this the information age. I'd like to call it the misinformation age. I can guarantee you if I read to you from this that I'm telling you the truth. Everything else is maybe in question and on some different form of thing. And, and, and this is one of the lies that, that it, it's just pervasive everywhere. I remember way back when we, we had, a, uh, we had a, a, an accident in the back of one of the restaurants and somebody hit the drive through and there was a couple other things and, and the supervisor was like, hey, all those other things that happened a couple months ago, make sure you add them on this claim. Well, that's a lie. That leads to theft. And, and the things that we do, in, in, so, so it can be just little like that. Even things we don't classify as lies can be out there. So again, the exercise and the application of that is, hey, these are things that we should be going through and asking God, how am I doing with this? And I'm telling you, that's a hard thing to do because God will be faithful to tell you that. And every time I've done that, I've, I've thought, wow, I knew I had some issues, but I didn't know I was doing as bad as I really was. Right? Every time I've asked God, show me what I'm doing wrong in my life, it's like, oh, here comes the jab. I had it coming. Right? But I've always learned from it too. Because he says, when you do that, since you have put off the old self with its practices and put on the new self, you are being renewed in the knowledge according to the image of your Creator. Because even as hard as it is to get right in front of God and sit with Him and face your sins and ask Him, the renewal is awesome. We're putting away the old self. And sometimes that can, be a, that can be a process, right? Romans 12 says, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that word renewal is metamorpho, which is the word we use for metamorphosis. Like when you're in grade school and you learn about how a caterpillar goes into the metamorphosis or into the chrysalis and then it's transformed and comes out as a butterfly or around here a moth right? That's what it should look like. We should be changed from the sinner that we were to something beautiful. But that process, just like the caterpillar, there's a lot of energy and there's a lot of things that happen, right? So, so God has earned a salvation and he says, live like this. So we don't do the work. We don't try to do these things to please God for salvation. We do these things to please God for obedience, for our relationship with him. See the difference in that? We obedience, not salvation. Right? But the freedom of having the uh, being renewed in the knowledge according to the image of your creator, it's a lot easier to do that when we're looking at the things above where Paul started. And dwell on that this week. We're being renewed. And then in Christ, there's no Greek, no Jew, no circumcision, no uncircumcision, no Scythian, no slave, and for free. But Christ is all in all. Look, not only for, for the, the, the Colossians in this day that, that, that he's addressing, look at how universal this is. Because, because in our day and age, what would you say? There's no Republican or Democrat or Libertarian. There's no black. There's no white. There's no Mexican. There's no Canadian. There's no American. There's only... Christ all in all. So because people want to make distinctions about what they see about a person's ethnicity, they, they, we want to make distinctions about, you you know, we're, we're better because we're Christians in Wyoming than Christians in California or whatever the distinction may be. We're all saved by grace through faith as believers. We're all people who should be sharing the gospel to whomever, no no matter whatever, right? And so the distinctions, one of the lies of the enemy is always to make the distinction between people. Oh, that person's harder to save for God than the other. Maybe there's no hope for that person, right? enemy loves those distinctions christ is saying i died for everybody all the sins of mankind for all time i don't care about their ethnicity where they came from what they did don't care because christ is all in all 
Right, so he finishes this section with that. Christ is all in all. And he's gone through this difficult thing and he's told us who Christ is and that we're in new life and what not to do. Next week, starting with verse 12, therefore, he's going to tell us how to live. How should we be living? In this next section, I often use it as a marriage blessing for a new couple because it is how to live the Christian life. So my encouragement to you now, before next week, is to have a conversation about this. We as believers should be honest that, hey, I'm struggling, right? And sometimes that can be hard because sometimes, because we live in these things that we just went through, that we feel like if we get honest, we're going to get shot. Christians sometimes are good at shooting the wounded. We should be a place where we can come to each other and say, I'm struggling with sin. I'm struggling with lying. I'm struggling with anger. I'm struggling with pornography. You would be surprised how many men in my office come and say that, and they're waiting for me. They're just waiting for me to verbally dress them down. I'm like, how long have you been struggling? You ready to get free? Are you hurting your family? How can I help you? What do you want to do? And, and just knowing that they have a safe place where they can come and they can confess whatever it is and start to work on it, So remember, if somebody comes to you or you see a believer not acting great, you and I have all been that person. We should be the people that are like, okay, let me help you understand that you are a new creation and how to be renewed in that new creation and not judge them and beat them up because we've all been there and we all want people to have that closer walk with him. So this week, focus on that. Ask the question, God, what in my life am I not doing according to your will? and look forward with anticipation, right? You're a new creation. Feel that and look forward next week to say, okay, now we're going to look at what it looks like to have the things in my life that are godly. Amen? Father God, I thank you for your word. And as difficult as it is to look at ourselves in the mirror and for me to look at myself in the mirror and truly just uh, ask you to change me, Lord, it's sometimes I don't know, but it's troubling because uh, I know there's something there because I'm I'm a sinful person, but Lord, you're faithful to point those things out and you're faithful to be gentle and and teach me, Lord, and bring people alongside to help me. Lord, that's one of the things that I really appreciate about this body of believers is that uh, I can't think of a time when I was struggling with something and you yourself, Lord, didn't help me and you didn't bring somebody alongside me to help me with the things I was struggling with. Lord, help us to be people that are going to be honest with ourselves and just ask you. Help us to be people that are looking out for other believers and helping them through this process. Lord, because of that, help us to be the people where Jesus, you you yourself tell us that we will they will know we are disciples by our love for one another. That's what this passage should get get us to because we are new creations and we should love each other deeply. And that we should be praying and caring for a lost and dying world. Lord, we thank thank you and just uh, look forward to anticipation with what you're going to do with each of our lives this week. And Lord, uh, look forward to um, just a victory of what you do and what it's like to be a new creation next week. In Jesus' name, amen.